Okay. Um, thank you all for making it to the snow. And welcome to our third session of DSAT Lectures and Planning Theory for the spring semester. Today we will have the pleasure to listen to Alan Berto, who is Senior Research Scholar at the Maryland Institute of Urban Urban Management um, at New York University. Alan's operational work and research focus on the intersection interaction between markets, regulation, and transport infrastructure, taking the spatial structures of peace. His most recent field assignment has been focused on urban transport, land development, and housing issues, and project implementation in cities like China, India, Indonesia, Russia, <coughs> Vietnam, Colombia, Mexico, and South Africa. From 1980 to 1999, he was a principal urban planner at the World Bank, where he advised local and national governments on urban development policies. Alan graduated at Architecture PLP from the Ecole Nationale de Perriot de Bombard in Paris, Section Architecture in 1997. Just recently, in December 2018, Alan completed his book on urban planning and markets published by MIT Press titled Order Without Design, How Markets Shape Free, which today's talk will be on. So after the lecture, we'll open the floor for questions, and with this, please join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's always a big pleasure and an honor to be at Columbia University. And I'm glad to see that the weather didn't uh, diminish the attendance. Uh, I, uh, so the, the, the goal of this talk is to talk about my new book that came just two months ago. Uh, I will not go chapter by chapter. I just uh, extracted some of the points uh, which are developed in the book. Uh, first, I, maybe I should give you my background. As uh, I'm an architect by you know, training, although at the time I studied architecture, uh, it was not clear that there was a difference between urban planning and architecture. The idea was that the city was just a very large building, and uh, which had to be designed by somebody uh, with some genius, you know, animated by genius. You know, it was not considered that cities were made of people, cities were the big one. So uh, I have evolved since that. I, uh, I hope that you will also all evolve from the things you have learned at university and develop a more way of seeing things. Uh, I, uh, you know, so I, I, I worked in urban planning for several years uh, and after, when I was 31, uh, for the first time on the job, I met with an urban economist. I had never met an urban economist before. I was not completely sure uh, what was the difference between economics and accounting, for instance. You know, people would deal with money and cost. Uh, and uh, it was a discovery because when we compare notes, we realize uh, I realized that uh, the thing that I have observed, and I thought were either idiosyncratic or, say, interesting things, that uh, regularities, suddenly I realized that there were a bunch of people since about 100 years have studied those things, have theories and models. So it was a bit, uh, I, I would compare it to somebody who you know, look at planets every night uh, with a telescope and suddenly fall on the work of uh, Newton and uh, you know, uh, the law of attraction and some gravity and things like that. So for me, it was really a discovery. Now, it didn't mean that uh, my skill as an urban planner were obsolete. It means that if I complemented this skill with the skill of economist, we would have a very good understanding of city work and how we can uh, modify cities. So uh, here and in my book, I make always a, a difference between uh, you know, developing models and understanding the mechanism of cities and comparing that what, with what I call uh, operational urban planning. That means every day you are in an office and you have pressure, somebody asks you, uh, you, you, we need a new street, uh, or, or why should be the street? Uh, we need, uh, should we limit the height of building in this area and things like that? This is 
This is operational urban planning. Uh, and most of the time, those decisions are taken just, uh, uh, you know, using instinct. And I think that they should not, we should not use instinct. We should use knowledge. Now, using knowledge, you can be completely wrong, of course. But at least you have a reason for being wrong, which means that uh, if things do not work the way you thought they were going to work, you can modify your judgment and probably do better before. You know, where uh, when you make a mistake, but this mistake is due only on, a, uh, on instinct, there is no way to modify things after or, or to learn from your experience. So let us start now with the, this introduction. Uh, this is a, the illustration I have on the cover of my book. Uh, it's uh, the distribution of population in Jakarta, Jabotabek, you know, the metropolitan area of Jakarta. And so the height here represents the density. So the volume of all these prisons are in fact proportional to the population. So this gives you a, a, a view of all the, of the population of Jakarta has been distributed on the built-up area. This is, I, I use this in the cover of my book because it's exactly, it illustrates what I call the, the spontaneous order uh, which arises in cities, which is in fact the sum of decision taken by individuals who decide to locate in the city. And if you make the sum of those decisions, those decisions, by the way, are not arbitrary. Uh, each person or each business who decide to locate here and to consume very little land or a lot of land, which is reflected in this graph here, uh, they take this decision based on on their own, you know, on something completely logical, at least from them point of view. So if you add all the logic, you end up with the structure of the city. Now, it's not quite so simple. Uh, originally, Jakarta, uh, you know, the port is here. I didn't show the, the, the that's the port, the sea is on the north here. So the port is here, the city developed that way, and there was only one main road which were linking Jakarta to this little town at the time, it was a separate town called Bogor. And so the city has a tendency to develop linearly along this highway. Why? Uh, because develop here are paddy fields, and developing uh, land in paddy fields is very expensive and difficult. You know, you have to build a lot of bridges, there are canals, uh, the, the, the foundation are expensive. So. Uh, at a certain point, the municipality was concerned that a, a linear city like that first it created an enormous congestion on the main road, which, by the way, is after a road which goes to all the highlands of Java, which are heavily populated, you know, like Bandung and area like that. So they decided to build a tall highway east-west like that. And so you see here, of course, the, the market, this individual decision of people uh, household and firm reacted to this new highway because suddenly the distance between here and here in terms of time becomes shorter than the very congested uh, time of travel from here to here. <coughs> so in a certain way, I could stop my talk right now. I would not. <laughs> but uh, because this, this is the essence of uh, what I think about cities. You have on one side a spontaneous order coming from the sum of decision of households and firms who decide um, you know, how much land to consume, how much floor space to consume based on their own welfare, to maximize their own welfare. And then you have also, so that's a grassroots thing. And then you have a top-down decision on major infrastructure. And this individual decision and the market will not provide this uh, major infrastructure. So somebody has to take the decision to do it. What is important is to understand this complementarity. The problem with urban planner and the way I was taught about urban planning is that they think they can impose a shape on everybody, and they think that 
anything which is spontaneous is disorder. Uh, in uh, if you read even uh, you know many of the reports, unfortunately, of my former employer, uh, the World Bank, uh, you will see reports about you know it could be Indonesia, India, or C Colombia. Uh, will say urbanization is haphazard, uh, you know, is uh, out of control. I think this is completely wrong. As a you know, even if uh, those cities are, might be a bit of a mess in terms of traffic or whatever, say, it's just uh, it's just wrong. Uh, nothing in a city is haphazard. You know, nothing is random. It's only it's always uh, there is always a reason. You know, I will I could uh, you know invoke Spinoza or Hegel on that. You know, nothing which exists uh, is. Uh, you know, everything which exists is logical in a certain way. So we have to have that, you know, we, uh, urban planners have to be a little more modest and, uh, and understand that their role is to support the sum of individual decision as best as they can. There might be individual decisions which are detrimental to the city. For instance, it could be that some area needs to be protected for some reason, erosion or something like that, then they should take the decision. But it should always be informed by something quantitative, and it cannot be just, uh, you know, a, a city in the form of a cross or a circle or a star is better than a city uh, something. Or, uh, you know, so here this this is really what what is important is this dialogue uh, between uh, this. Uh, uh, you know the the random not random the, you know the grassroots movement coming from this spontaneous order emerging from market and then what you can do uh, so I like to quote uh, three three persons here Leonardo da Pisa was also uh, his other name is Fibonacci uh, you know the, the series of Fibonacci and but also he, by the way he introduced from India the zero in uh, uh, and, the, and the numbers coming from India. You, know, you imagine before Fibonacci, uh, if you were doing ex extracting a grassroots, you would have to do it with uh, Roman numbers. You, you imagine <laughs> how difficult it must have been. So, the, uh, so there is no knowledge without measurement. I, uh, I agree with many of the objectives of my fellow urban planners, you know, if they talk about livability or sustainability, where I disagree with them is if they don't measure it, you know. If you just say uh, at the beginning of your, your chapter, your report, this is sustainable, my, my concern is sustainability, but there are no indicators to show what do you mean, what, what is it really, have you achieved it, uh, is this plan really sustainable, then how do you define it? I think it's just, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's just like propaganda. I mean, you know, it's a myth. It's a, it's a dream. So we have to measure everything. There is no knowledge. Uh, finally, the, the last two, uh, you know, Adam Ferguson, the, the Scottish Enlightenment, uh, is, uh, you know, he, he, I, I suppose he discovered really uh, what is the execution, you know, the, the result of human action, but not the execution of any... Uh, human design. Now, he was, I don't think he was, uh, when he wrote that, he was not talking about cities. He was talking about more, uh, again, commercial order and things like that, exchanges and commerce. But I think it applies absolutely to cities. And we have to bear in mind. And the, th the same with Hayek also, uh, you know, order generated without design. Again, the, this concept of a spontaneous order emerging you know, but which is created by, by human being, you know, it's not, uh, it's not a natural order like geology or something like that. It's, but, but there is no design with, uh, you know, somebody would design it in a certain way. And so that's really the essence of uh, my book. So uh, design is top down, market is grassroots. Now, when I talk about market, I have to make sure that we understand each other. Uh, because sometimes markets is used ideologically. Uh, markets are a, it's a mechanism. It's like gravity or something. It's always there. Even in country which try to eliminate markets, like the Soviet Union or China before reform, you had black market. 
Without black market, this country would have collapsed much before. So market, market was not invented uh, you know, during the Industrial Revolution or was not in, invented by uh, Bezos. You know. Market uh, existed as soon as uh, probably there were cities or even uh, maybe before cities, uh, the first agricultures. Those are human mechanisms, human created mechanisms. Markets, it's not a religion, it's not a god, it's a mechanism like gravity. So sometimes you may not be happy with the outcome of the market. This is completely legitimate. You have to explain why, and you can take measure to contradict it. But if you do not understand how market work, you cannot modify the outcome of the market. So again, here, when I talk about market, I'm not saying, you know, it's your judgment to decide whether the outcome of the market is positive for human beings, maximize welfare or not. This is your judgment. You know, I make my own judgment on it, but you could have a very different judgment on it. This is completely acceptable. But if you say, I will ignore market, it's a bit like somebody designing an airplane and telling you, uh, I don't take gravity into account in designing my airplane. No chance of success there. This is uh, one my former boss, actually, for for a few months, uh, Le Corbusier. I didn't design that. Uh, his idea was that the role of uh, of the planner and the architect, but by extension, the planner, is to impose a shape on on things, and that people will have to to fit into this shape. Uh, Corbusier at this idea that, for some reason, he thought the, the streets were bad, and that we have to invent a city without street. Now, it's interesting because he was living in, he was living in the sixth arrondissement in Paris, which is still one of the most pleasant places to walk around in terms of city. You know, with a lot of cafe, restaurant, uh, art gallery. But for some reason, he, he thought that uh, the, the French were spending too much time in, uh, in cafe, which he, May I add a point there, but uh, <laughs> by my own experience, yes. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, it is not the role of the planner or the architect to prevent people from going to cafe. You know, it is maybe the role of uh, a moral leader, a guru. It could be maybe a politician. Uh, uh, certainly not of an urban planner. So here, his idea was to to design a city where. Uh, everybody would be in tower, whether you work or live, the tower, and then the tower in the park. And so after you finish working, you just jog. You don't go to the cafe. Uh, and, and then it resulted in, you know, in this type of architecture. Now, you see, uh, we will see now the difference between market and design. As soon as you say design I design something which is optimum for the people I want to serve. Uh, you have something uniform by definition. Because if you have invented a better way of living, there is no reason to do it differently. So you have this, this uh, you know, uniformity. And this is, this is a contrast. This is Poudon. You see, so uh, Poudon is a, you know, it's a, it's a financial center of Shanghai. And uh, this is, this picture, by the way, was taken about six years ago. So there are two more, sky, well, three more skyscrapers now, which are much taller than that. So it's even more spectacular. So here, uh, this is, you know, this is market in the sense that you see each building is different. Uh, the, the first building which we built were relatively low, you know, this one, this one, here, here, uh, because uh, it was not certain that uh, Pudong would be a success, and uh, the government, you know, you could develop Pudong only uh, because infrastructure was built, you know, uh, across the river here, the Wangpo, you need to, to have uh, bridges and tunnel. Without the bridge and tunnel, there would be no Pudong, so there would be no market, you know, the, the land, the land, if it's not accessible, it's across a river, which is about 
uh, half of uh, the width of the, the one point is about half of the Hudson River, you know, it's pretty wide. Uh, the, the land has no value. So you see here again the interaction between market and, and infrastructure and design. But uh, after people realized that, uh, that the, the government was serious about building the infrastructure and they could do it very fast, suddenly, of course, the price went up. And that explained the skyscraper. You do not forget, skyscraper are there. Uh, it's not a, a decoration. Skyscraper are there because land is expensive. A lot of people want to be in this area. Uh, it is not just to, uh, uh, to, to make a landmark. Uh, to build a skyscraper you know, per square meter, per square foot, the construction is much higher. You, know, you have a lot of utilities, which are expensive, which are taking a lot of space to. You know, if you look at uh, 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 in a floor plan, of a, a very tall building, you will see the amount of uh, floor space that the utilities are taking. So it's expensive, but it is worth doing only uh, if there is a very high demand. So you see this to me is exactly, uh, it's not design, you know, every, every individual building is design, but the skyline Ex, uh, you know, show the market. It's not designed. And then you see the difference with before. You see this uh, enormous variety that uh, market are created. Because before, you know, between the time where this building was built and, and this one, the technology has changed too. And that reflects this technology. And this is what is interesting about cities. You know, that they reflect uh, as the, the, the technology evolve or the taste also of consumer evolve, different building will reflect uh, this. Imagine if uh, Corbusier had been asked uh, by the Chinese government, you know, uh, 50 years before, to, to design this, you will have uniform tower covering the whole thing. And they will be a bit like Brasilia, they will probably declare them a patrimony of humanity and therefore will not be able to change anything. <laughs> so uh, when I talk about spontaneous order created by market, uh, let us, you know, and uh, I always say we have to be quantitative. So uh, you should, uh, you know, I should prove, the, prove my point that this spontaneous order is universal. And I prove it by this graph here. Uh, I've selected here, I, I have a, a total of about 61 city now that Marianne and I have measured exactly the same way. You know, measuring density, uh, you, you need to have the, the same methodology uh, to do it. If not, uh, you, know, you could end up with very different numbers. And so we have measured densities exactly the same way. And the way we measure density, we we start from the CBD, the center of the city, we build rings and, uh, of one kilometer, and we measure the built-up area within each ring, and from the census data, the population within each ring, then we divide the population by the built-up area, and that gives us the density in one ring. Now, we have here 12 cities, uh, we have nothing to do with each other on different continents, a completely different history, uh, different income, uh, different climate, different culture. They have nothing to do with each other. They have one thing in common. All of them have densities which decrease from the center to the periphery. So the, those graphs here are showing from zero to 30 kilometers, and the density are all measured the same way, uh, from zero to 300 and 50 people per hectare. All these graphs are at the same scale. So you see that Paris, Warsaw, Barcelona, European cities have great, and the, the gradient, you know, the, the way the density decrees follow going below what uh, the model of uh, economists mm -hmm. have shown theoretically <coughs> and uh, confirm empirically. Uh, it's a uh, it's a negatively slope uh, exponential curve. Uh, why that? I mean, the, you know, if you go to the literature, you'll find, for instance, a partner uh, explain exactly all, all those equations where they arrive. But 
all these cities which have nothing to do with each other, more or less follow, uh, you know, we have here Beijing, Jakarta, and Bangkok in Asia, Atlanta, Los Angeles, New York. Now, Atlanta, if you, it's, it looks quite flat. If you blow it up at, uh, you know, at the, you know, the top density in Atlanta is of course a, a fraction of Paris or Beijing, uh, but you will find exactly a curve which is actually a bit like that, but you know, so it follows exactly the same pattern. And this pattern is derived from market. That's the way the land market works. That means people make a choice when they consume land. If it is close to the center, they decide, you know, land is expensive because everybody wants to be close to the center. And so they consume very little land and uh, they make a trade-off when they are in the periphery. Uh, they will, have, uh, they will have commuting costs, which are higher. Uh, if you have an office building, it will be more difficult. If you are in the periphery to get workers than if you are in the center. So in exchange of that, you consume, that allow you to consume more land. <coughs> Some business too uh, have to consume more land. You know, for instance, if you are manufacturing uh, furniture, uh, certainly you will not select a place in Manhattan. You know, it will not make sense. Although you may have a lot of plants in that, right? but uh, to manufacture furniture, you need space, you need land. And uh, it will be far, your, your uh, furniture, if they reflect the capital costs of policy, then including land, uh, they will be, of course, completely unaffordable. Now, you may decide if you make furniture to have your factory here, so where land is not expensive. However, you may need a designer for your furniture. And it's possible that then you will hire a designer in a firm, a design firm, which may be located right in the center. So you see, you can, you, depending on what you do, you adapt to, to this thing. So all this to tell you again that this very different city, different, follow this. This is again the spontaneous order of the market. If you do not, understand it, if you think that this is an aberration, that, let's say, the optimum density for Bangkok should be 200 people per hectare, and the density should be like that, and you design it to be like that, because you think this, is, uh, this will avoid this war or something like that, this is never going to happen. It's never going to, so you are losing your time. If you design an infrastructure saying, well, the, all the infrastructure of Bangkok is going to hundred, so you are going to design a lot of infrastructure here to accommodate much more people than uh, there is demand for. You are losing your time and you are losing, of course, you are wasting the taxpayer money. So you have better understand that thing. Now, those curves will change with time, but again, economists could tell you not exactly uh, how they will change, you know, what, you know, in, it, they cannot tell you in 20 years whether the density here will be higher or lower, but they can tell you if the price of transport change, if income change, uh, if technology change for transport, for instance, reflecting again the transport time and cost, the, the density will go higher or lower. They can tell you in which directions it will go. So that's decrease the number of mistakes you can do. Because you, you will know. Now, uh, this is also a density curve. Uh, it's from Brasilia, and it goes to, you know, from zero to 40 kilometers, you know, on the ground, and the density goes to 120. Now, this contradicts completely what I've shown before. Uh, well, Brasilia was entirely designed there was no market, you know, the land belonged entirely to the government and the land was distributed by the government first to the top civil servant, then the next tier of civil servants, and then another tier of civil servant, and then after all, all the people who work for the city, you know, wash dishes, who cook for the, the civil servant and, uh, or, or, you know, clean the offices, well, those have to fend for themselves. Uh, they were not part of the design. So they end up in the suburbs. So the, by 
pushing the poorest people by design, by design, you know, the market will have never done that. By design, pushing them in the suburb, you end up with this reverse gradient, you know, completely contradicting market. So, fortunately, not many planners or architects uh, are asked to design cities like Brasilia and those states. You know, there, there are very, very few which have been done. And uh, so th this type of myth, I, I don't think any of you will have the occasion to, to make this type of mistake. But it's just to show uh, that indeed uh, this gradient of density is, uh, uh, you know, is created by market. And if you design entirely that, you may, you may completely contradict uh, this. So cities are primarily labor market. Uh, this is very shocking to a lot of people, like most of us, I suppose, in this room, who like cities. Uh, cities for us are much more than that. You know, uh, cities are where you meet new people, you meet friends, you go to concerts, you go to theater, you go to cafe, you go to restaurants, uh, you jog in the park, even without or even call there, but, uh, and uh, uh, yes, all these things are possible in cities are what make your city attractive, but they are built on the labor market. If the labor market doesn't work, then all this, this superstructure, which is so attractive, which is built on top of it, all this collapse. We have the example of Detroit, a tragic example of Detroit, in the US, which Detroit was a very cultural city. It has one of the best uh, you know, art museums in the world, by the way. It uh, was well known also for creating new music. Uh, all this thing collapsed completely when the labor market collapsed. So the main job of the urban planner is first and foremost to make sure that the labor market function as a city expands. What is a labor market? A labor market is not that everybody has a job and live close to its job and stay there all the time. Labor market has the word market in it. It means that constantly, if you are a worker, you are looking at all the jobs which are available in the city and you are looking for a better job. A better job, maybe which pays better, maybe which is closer to the place where you work, but most importantly, where you think you fit better, either, either because it's more interesting, or maybe because you have, you have some skills that you have discovered after you left college, and uh, uh, that are more fit to one type of job than another. You know, we are all very different, and that, that what uh, makes the, the wealth of a city is all these difference put together, which are in fact complementary. But this talent can be used in a city only if yourself are moving and your employers also, when they select people, are trying to find exactly the, the right people who fit what we need. And by the way, within the firm, of course, employers know that they need very different types of people. You know, if somebody is keeping their book, you know, doing their, their accounting, they don't want somebody with too much imagination, frankly. But they want somebody who is very accurate, very systematic, who is always there on time. On the other hand, if they want to design something, you know, like furniture, uh, they may want a completely different personality. Somebody who may arrive late at the office uh, sometime or, or, or leave late. Somebody who is very different. So you see, the labor market is that is this possibility of constantly uh, changing work. Now, I, I'm not saying that you should change work all the time. I'm just saying that as soon as you are dissatisfied with your job, either because of the salary or because you find it boring, the advantage of living in like a city like New York or Paris or London or Jakarta is that you can easily find something else which is better, which fits better. And by moving like that several times, eventually you will end up with something that probably you enjoy more, uh, and everybody will be better off for it. 
Well, not only you, but the entire society. So here is just to show that concentration of people by itself doesn't create a labor market. This is an area uh, of, of several square kilometers, uh, 55 square kilometer, in the, uh, in the countryside near at the east of Luoyang in China. Uh, so it's countryside. Uh, if you measure the density here in this rectangle, you have a density of 23 people per hectare, which is about the density of Los Angeles, and which is about three times the density of Atlanta, the built up area. So Atlanta and Los Angeles are obviously a labor market. This is not a labor market, although it has the same density as a labor market. You know, you can see it, these are villages. Uh, they are linked by roads, you know, some larger than others. But uh, basically, those villagers are probably working in the field around that. Uh, some of them here in the larger one probably um, repairing uh, water pumps or tractors or something like that. So there, there are some you know, non-agricultural activities. But this is not a labor market. Uh, in pre-reform China and in the Soviet Union, you had dense cities with a lot of industrial workers. But very often, there was no labor market in, in the sense that uh, people were given a job when they get out of either high school or university. And usually, they will stay in the same, same company, not necessarily the same job, all their life, because there was no labor market. There was no advertising of saying, well, we, we need uh, somebody there, and you will pay. The salary was decided uh, you know, by, by the central government. So you see, a labor market is not uh, getting, you know, having a job close to you. you know, uh, one example would be jails. You know, a lot of uh, prisoners work in jail. Uh, and so in a way, it's an ideal situation. They are very short commute, usually. Uh, they, they cannot be fired unless they do something really terrible. Uh, and uh, it's a very regular job. Uh, it is not a labor market. You cannot, you will not expect much, much innovation coming from the workers in the jail, you know, not, not much. So this is not a labor market. You know, so that's very important. You know, some, uh, some people think that labor market is, is in fact a, uh, just being, being employed and being close to your employment uh, area. This is not that at all. So one of the consequences of my definition of labor market is the movement of people across a metropolitan area. Here, I have what I call the classical monocentric model. Uh, most cities go through this stage until the city reach maybe one million, one million and a half. You have a high concentration of job in the center, density are also higher in the center, and then uh, people go to their job by either they live close to the center or from the periphery they go to, uh, to the center. So that's a monocentric model. A number of cities uh, follow this, you know, when they are relatively small, follow this model. Uh, then you have the dispersed model, where, which represents practically the, the, the way trips are organized in Los Angeles or in Atlanta, where people, in fact, uh, seems to have a random movement or random movement from one part to another. So here you see the difference between the two is that here you have, you have dispersed origin, but you have concentrated destination. So that allows you a certain type of transport, which would be efficient transit. And, and you have to end up also in very dense area when you're in the center. So here, transit is, is very efficient in a situation like that. Here on the contrary, because everything is dispersed, uh, probably the car or at least a uh, smaller vehicle with four or five passengers will be the, the most efficient way of getting around because you have dispersed origin, dispersed destination. And that, uh, this of course happened in cities which were developed uh, in country where uh, the car was affordable to a large number of people. Then the most common model is in fact this. Uh, it's what I call the composite model. You had originally a city with a strong center, you know, like London or, or Manhattan or Paris or Shanghai. And then as the city expands, you start having more and more trips which are from suburbs to suburbs. You still have 
is a large number of trips which are from suburbs to center, but you have more and more trips which are uh, from suburb to suburbs. And our observation in the last 20 years is that as city expand, the number of jobs which are dispersed in suburb is larger and larger. In, in New York metropolitan area, so I'm counting here 20 million people, and in Paris metropolitan area, 12 million people, 70% of the, of the job, of the trip, commuting trips, are from suburbs to suburbs. You know, we have always this idea that when we see Manhattan or the center of Paris or the center of London, that this is really the destination of everybody. It's the destination of all the tourists, not necessarily all the workers who are you know, providing the economy. So this is a model uh, which is the most common. And then as a city expands, in a way, the dispersed model becomes more and more important in terms of the percentage of trip. This, is, uh, this do not exist. Uh, it exists only in the mind of urban planners. But I, I show it here because I am often uh, asked to review master plans. And uh, I found this model very often in the master plan. Basically, the idea completely contradicts the idea of a labor market. They, they think that planners can be so skilled that they could match exactly housing and employment. And therefore, that will solve the major problem which exists in those three models, is that trips are becoming longer and longer. And how do we manage those trips? What technology will allow those trips to be less than one hour? Uh, so they say, well, if we could match exactly workers and jobs, then everybody could bicycle to his work. So, you, so a large metropolis will not be one large labor market. It will be uh, 10 or 15 smaller labor market, and everybody will be very happy. But uh, that's, that's a fairy tale. Uh, it doesn't exist in reality because, you know, you may, don't get me wrong, you may have cities which have a lot of little center like that. Some cities grow like that. But you will never find this pattern of trips. You see, the, the, the people who are working here, you will see there are some who are coming from the other side and things like that. So, so this do not exist. And if you do a master plan which says this is the way it's going to work, you are going again to waste completely. You are not going to develop the type of transport system which will allow the, the labor market to work. So you will have a fragmentation of the labor market. Now, this exists in many cities. For instance, in a city like Mexico City, which 22 million people, uh, the transport system uh, you know, is difficult because, again, you have this dispersion now, more and more dispersion. So the subway system, which was, uh, when it was created, extremely modern and efficient, now is serving only a relatively small part of the population. And uh, uh, most of uh, uh, the, the trips are, in fact, through collective taxi. Again, because collective taxi are relatively good at serving dispersed origin, dispersed destination of trip. So you see, and then the result of that is that, in fact, uh, Mexico City, if you have 20 million people, let's say that the, the, the labor, uh, the size of the labor is 10 million, uh, you have probably three labor market of three million and a half or something like that. So, so if you could improve the transport system in Mexico City, probably, and again, I rely on the work of economists there, probably the GDP of Mexico will increase, salary will increase also. The salary of the people there for exactly the same job will increase. Finally, uh, talking about shapes, in China now, they are moving from this model to this model, uh, what the Chinese government call cluster cities. Now, uh, contrary to what people think in the West, uh, the Chinese government didn't decide one day, let's do cluster cities. Uh, they realized that uh, although most of their cities were designed as monocentric, you know, with a uh, ring road around them, uh, it emerged smaller towns, smaller towns which develop industries which were complementary. And then instead of having one large city 
with suburbs, suddenly you had a lot of different centers who compete with each other but complement each other. And when, uh, you know, uh, what was, uh, Tom, Tom Cook, yeah, the, the head of Apple, what's, uh, <coughs> Tim Cook, yes, Tim Cook, yeah. Tim Cook, uh, some, uh, what, two, three months ago, uh, said, you know, he was asked why they are not manufacturing Apple uh, phone in the US. And he said, it is not anymore because Chinese workers are cheaper than American. It's not, it's not a very big factor, it's not th that much. It's because in China, we have supply chains which can, which can allow the manufacturing and the changing of the manufacturing extremely fast. And the ch supply chain, this is the way it looks. And again, this came spontaneously. You know, the fact the Chinese government didn't say, oh, in this little town we are going to make switches, and in this other time we are going to make uh, screens. And no, it happened spontaneously. They just, you know, they knew there was a demand for that. Uh, entrepreneurs were looking for land, and they wanted to look for land in an area where land was not too expensive, but still had a relatively good access to their labor and things like that, and they took a decision. Ah, sorry, that's uh, or the other. <laughs> yes. Uh, so you see, uh, this. Uh, so this gives us a completely different pattern. Uh, this is the Pearl River Delta, which, by the way, now I understand it's called the Greater Bay Area. Uh, but it's, it's a little confusing for Americans because they may think we're talking about San Francisco. San Francisco, you know, so here uh, in red is what is built or was built in 2010. It's probably larger now. Uh, we have uh, here 65 million people. 65 million people, in, you know, you see the scale here is 200 kilometers. So this is the size of a country like the UK or France. But I won't say as one city yet, but very close to one city. Uh, and now, what is missing here, you see, the, uh, is a transport system which could completely integrate this market. Now, from Hong Kong to Guangzhou, you have now a rapid train, and you have to be careful in China because things change so fast that you are, your data is always out of. But if I remember well, you can go now in 40 minutes from uh, Hong Kong to Guangzhou in rapid train. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, you, know, you could commute anywhere from here in 40 minutes because you still need to get to the station. And then when you arrive in Guangzhou, you, you are still at the station. You still need to get to your job. But the, the Chinese now are completely aware that the challenge of a, an urban development like that is transport. The transport we know now will not allow this to be a really integrated labor market. Uh, subway, BRT are too slow. You know, a subway which stops every kilometer, kilometer and a half, or two kilometer, is too slow for a distance like that. So you need something else. Then when you arrive at a station, uh, you still need to go somewhere, you know, to your job. So you have to have a system which is different. So that's, that's, uh, that's McKinsey projection of uh, automatic vehicle, you know, uh, autom sorry, uh, autonomous vehicle in China. Now, I don't know how good is this projection. Sometimes McKinsey does a good job, sometimes maybe not as good. But, uh, uh, this is, this is still based on the research. You see, in 2040, they project that the majority of the vehicle, <coughs> and most of them will be, of course, in urban area, will be, uh, will be uh, you know, autonomous vehicle for mobility service. So they will not be private. There will be a minority of one which are private, you know, somebody has his own 
self-driving, which would be the equivalent of a driver, basically. But, uh, and that means that they will use a fraction of the road space, because if uh, those uh, uh, shared vehicles have four or five uh, passengers, uh, they provide you know door to door transportation practically, and uh, with a fraction of the road space that the normal car will use. Not only because you have more passenger per vehicle, but also being autonomous, they can reduce the distance between vehicles, you know, which is uh, the major effect. Of the road. So I cannot develop that too much now, uh, but just to say that uh, in order for those. Change, you know, as city change, they adapt also to uh, new technology, and we have to completely revise you know, uh, our either prejudices or, or tastes that we have for whatever. You know, the idea that uh, you know, subway are the good guys and uh, individual vehicles are the bad guys, or even collective taxi. Usually, most of my colleagues in, in transport think that collective taxi are the bad guys. Uh, I think we have to revise this, and not not because we should shift to our taste, but just we look at numbers, and we will find that really, uh, you know, if we want to accommodate this, uh, this is the way. We... Now, if uh, if the Chinese cities succeed in uh, having integrated labor market of 60 million people. The productivity and the creativity in those markets is going to be, you know, in multiple of what we know. You know, it will be equivalent, I think, to relatively during the industrial revolution. You know, the productivity of the UK uh, compared to the rest of the world because of the technology change. You know, so it's something we have better be aware of. Uh, and and you know, when we are dealing with city non-Chinese cities, some of us who work non-Chinese. Uh, to, I'm not saying that every city should become a cluster, you know, some uh, uh, should not, but uh, if there is an opportunity, we should look again at the transport system, you know, even in, in the New York metropolitan area or the San Francisco Bay area, uh, there are certainly big improvements in transport, which we will. So what is, what is the role of the planner in all that? Uh, for me, the best planning was done Sixth century ago, you know, in the sixth century, that more than sixth century, ago. Uh, and we have not much improved. What is the job of the planner? The job of the planner is to create a network of streets which will allow this labor market to function. Now, the planner cannot exactly project how many workers will be there in uh, 100 years or something like that, but the important thing is to put a boundary and say, this is a street network, largely in advance, and this is a private land. On the private land, people can do whatever they want. We don't know. We don't care. But anything which is public should be set in advance, and the boundary is set in advance. And that, by the way, allows the market to work. If there is an uncertainty whether a piece of land in the suburb could be reserved for a park, or a street, but you don't know in advance, there is no labor market. So you, to separate that, even if you are wrong in terms of streets, you know, the streets uh, should have been a lot wider, I think, like that, doesn't matter, compared to the advantage of having that. Another thing that uh, was done in Miletus uh, is that they also selected the area for the public space, you know, not only the street. and. If you were Greek at that time, uh, the things which were very important were the theater. You know, the, the Greek always considered that the theater was an important form of, uh, uh, you know, the city thing. You had uh, you had the, the agora here, you know, where people were doing business. By the way, doing business and also the tribunal. You know, they were all together because people had contract. They sometimes dispute with contract. So that was a public space. So it was reserved. Uh, in advance in a good location. And then here, this was sport, and eh? the palestra, uh, the sport was supposed to be important. Uh, not so much a spectator sport, but people who uh, do sports, you know, it was sport. Yeah. So you see here, this is the job of the urban planner. Reserve area which have to be protected, which will be outside the market, 
like shore, you know, the, uh, along rivers, for instance, uh, parks, uh, little hills, uh, forests, whatever. Uh, and then have a network of streets so that this labor market can work as it expands. This, unfortunately, uh, so that was not, you know, I, I quote uh, Miletus because, in a way, it's my culture, but say the same idea came in China, uh, you know, uh, much before, well, that was Tantin Dynasty. By the way, at a much larger scale, you see, the, this was, the Shanghai was the capital, but if you compare it for to Manhattan, for instance, the width of Manhattan would be about that here. Manhattan would be a little longer. The, the area is about the area of Manhattan, but it will be lo longer like that. So you see that the blocks here were in fact, uh, uh, you know, they were inside blocks which were at a uh, smaller scale. So here again, this idea in the Tang Dynasty that people had to circulate from one part of the city to another and move, you know, not at all the model that you have seen before, where you, you have a lot of little uh, little city put together. You know, it, it was this idea that you move around in the entire city. Uh, I will pass that. This is, you know, so some people ask me, but why can't a city be provided by market? After all, it's, you know, you, you could conceive that. Uh, you can conceive a, a water system, for instance, uh, entirely designed by market. It's conceivable. Streets are not, uh, because this is an example of a market-provided street system. This is a suburb of Cairo. It's in an area that uh, the government decided should stay agricultural, so, they zone it. so on the plan it was green. But it was very close, again, they do not understand land prices, so it's very close to the center of Cairo. So people just uh, invade, you know, bought from farmers, it's not squatter, they bought the land for farmers, and they developed streets. So every developer, uh, you know, put his street, which give access to his own lot. But if you put all that together, you don't have a, a transport system which allows people to move. You know, most of these streets are, are about four or five meters, you know, so that's, uh, that's it. This distance, right? This distance. So, so uh, you you do not, you know, it's it's fine to give access to a flat, but not enough if you have thousands of them to move from one part of the city to another. So again, this ignore labor market. You know, it doesn't allow labor market to work very well. One. Uh, secondary function is decrease external, uh, you know, negative externalities. For instance, you, you don't want to, to have a uh, lead smelter close to, to a school. Now, frankly, this could have happened during the Industrial Revolution, in the, you know, the time of Dickens, maybe. Uh, I don't see anything like that uh, happening. Now, there are still some negative externalities that mean, uh, you know, some uh, activity which create noise or smells or things like that which we, but these are relatively minor. They should be controlled. If we we go to, I, I would pass that. Uh, if we, you know, modern planning has gone completely astray by suddenly uh, originally providing this right of way for street, and suddenly trying to design what is happening in the private uh, lot in much, much, too much detail. And uh, so I think that I have to now pass my time, so I will go to directly to the, the conclusion. <coughs> yeah, you see, the urban planners have a role which is extremely important but they are not playing it. They are mostly concentrating in uh, trying to, to piggyback as many regulations as possible on the individual lot. Huh? If you look at, you know, when I, I wrote my book, I tried, you know, one chapter I was talking about New York City zoning that I thought I knew well because uh, many years ago I worked for the City Planning Commission. And then I, I tried to count how many 
zoning, uh, you know, how many zoning uh, area they are, you know, type of zoning. And uh, after about a week, I gave up because it would have taken me more than a month just to count how many zoning category they are because of overlays and so on. And this is becoming now a specialty in New York. You have a few lawyers who know exactly that. And you cannot build anything unless you go through those lawyers. Uh, I think this is completely wrong. Uh, there are few cities, for instance, Tokyo has a very simple uh, zoning regulation. You know, there, is, uh, there, there are six categories which you know, can be subdivided in three more or four more, but it's relatively easy to understand. It gives an end use which can be disconcerting for us because you see things that you will not see in an American city which are close to each other, but you don't see a red smelter next to a primary school. Uh, what you see is an art gallery next to a restaurant, next to a school, next to a, a street floor building, next to an individual building, and so on. So, uh, I think that what planners should concentrate on is to provide this network of transport and infrastructure, because as a city develops, you still need to provide drainage, storm drainage, and water, and sewer, and, and of course, social facilities. Concentrate on those aspects, and do not try to completely design the city by the proxy of regulation. So, you know, for instance, this is an example of this, this is a see this is a Washington Square here. So this is Soho here. Uh, most of Soho is still zone manufacturing. Now there is no manufacturing in Soho. You know, nobody could uh, could uh, could have a factory in Soho. It won't be viable. So every time you want to build something there, you have to ask for an exception. Uh, they were they were artists who occupied uh, loft, you know, which were abandoned factory uh, on the top, and so the city uh, didn't want to, uh, you know, it was kind of awkward to kick out artists in the center of Manhattan, it looks bad in the city. So they, they asked them to require a permit from the city, this is still now, that's not an old story, uh, to require a permit to prove they were artists and they had to live there, and then they would be given a certificate uh, which says that they are assumed to be manufacturer, you know, for, for the zoning, so they could continue living there and working there. You know, when, so the, the, the city now, the, the city which has 60,000 homeless people, maintain a committee to review the portfolio of artists who, who, who ask for the permission to live here. You see, this is complete deviation of uh, what uh, an urban planner should do. So this is an extreme. You would find the reference, and by the way, uh, in my book, I even give the reference if you want to apply as an artist, because it's still there. You, know, mm -hmm. you will see the portfolio you have to send. And like that. Yeah. Uh, so this is the type of things, you know, uh, the way the zoning, the zoning, every, every category is full of numbers. Uh, nobody knows why this number is there. This little number, DU factor here, decide how many dwelling units are allowed uh, in, uh, you know, how many dwelling units are allowed in the lot, uh, indirectly, because you have to divide the total number of floors, you know, the, of floor space, multiply the lot area by, uh, by the FAR, and you divide it by this number, and that gives you the number of dwelling units. So this is why, uh, Recently, there was an article, well, last year in, in uh, New York Times, showing all the building in Manhattan, which would be illegal now because of those regulations. 40% 40, 40 of the building in Manhattan could not be built now. And you see, those are not, uh, for instance, some are too tall. You'll be surprised that some building in Manhattan are too tall. Many of them are on the east side. Some of them on the west, uh, west village, for instance. And some, some are Tribeca here. Uh, why, you know, what kind of number, what kind, you know, what kind of planners knows exactly what is the correct height of building here, you know? Uh, so, you will not believe that some have too many apartments. 
you know, with the with the need for for Dwayne in the in New York, these are the the one in blue here are the building which have too many apartments, and those here in green have too many businesses. So what planners on which information do they decide how many business should be you know in the village or in the east side or, or wherever? There is no information which I have. This is typically what the market does very well. You know, if uh, uh, you know if you establish a business and uh, it's five, it's fine. If it's close, if it's uh, not a good place for business, it will close. Don't worry about it. So, this uh, this is my my conclusion. Sorry, I've been a little longer than I thought, but uh, people who know me are used to it. But uh, uh, it's it's important to understand what is the purpose uh, and concentrate on those issues. You know, again, maintaining this labor market. Developing indicators, quantitative indicators, uh, to know, for instance, monitoring uh, trip time, you know, commit, commuting time. Do the commuting time decrease because you do something, or does it increase? Uh, affordability, of course. Monitoring affordability, you know, monitoring, monitoring land prices and rent. And don't forget that the planners control the supply of land and housing through their regulation and through the infrastructure. So if you have high housing prices, planners should take a responsibility for it because they control transport and infrastructure. They control the supply. And they usually don't. You know, Usually they say, ah, it's speculators, it's uh, greedy uh, developers or something like that. This is not. They, they are controlling the supply. You have seen in the, uh, in the Manhattan plan that they considered that there are too, already too many dwelling units in New York. You know? That means that if you demolish one of those buildings, you have to build another building with less dwelling units in this area. This is what it means. So they have a responsibility. They should take responsibility. Thank you. Yes. You, take, you talk about the planners. Yes. Who in New York does the infrastructure, the subways? Ah. Who does the subways? Uh, uh, is that this? The, yeah, the subway. Yeah, that's another aspect. The, the subway, uh, it's a, it's an autonomous agency, which is most controlled by, by the state and the city. And, and, who, and, does, and who does the zoning? Uh, the zoning is done in the city. But you said the planner. Who are these planners above all of these people, above mm -hmm. all of these agencies? And who controls the amount of street space there is? Uh, that's the amount of street space has been uh, decided long ago. So, okay, but, 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 uh, uh, but say, uh, the way you use the street space, that's, uh, yeah. that's uh, you know, it's more the way you use it. You know, uh, let's say, I, let's face it, I blame planners. Uh, of course, planners are subject to politicians because they are hired by politicians. So, uh, you know, it's a proxy for, for a system which is democratic, but I think that people are not knowledgeable enough when they vote to know exactly what is involved. So, to, to get back to the street, uh, what? If you, take, uh, if you take away the sidewalk, uh, about 40% of the street space uh, is occupied by parking cars. Oh, people choose cars. We shouldn't get in the way of their market. People like cars. Yes. They have a right yeah. to that space. That's not market. If they have a free parking space, that's not market to me. Oh, they pay taxes. No, 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 no. You have to pay for, you know, if you occupy 20 square meter of land, you have to pay for 20 square meter of land. Because, because there are a lot of people in New York who do not have cars, so, so they have the tax of their cars. They don't have parking meters. Yes. And charge them for using the space while they park. Well, is it a good way of... Uh, no, I don't think... I mean, the bigger yeah. point... No, is, you were asking who yeah, takes the decision. No, the bigger point, you said planners ought to be um, get diminishing negative externalities. Right, yeah. And then you said that they shouldn't really regulate the buildings, but the buildings have a need to be on the street. There's only... There's only there's 200 years we've had the same amount of streets. Right. Yeah. Yes. That hasn't changed. Yes. And um, and if you know and if there and if you 
When you put more buildings up, you make more demands on the infrastructure of the yes, border. Yes, yes, yes. So, yes, yes. but they should have no, but they should have no said about adding those extra externalities. They, they should, you know. No, shouldn't they, why? Why shouldn't they? If you have, if you have a problem of affordability, the way you have it here, you know, for me, a problem of affordability is if you have a school teacher who has a job in the city, and everybody agreed that the school teacher, it's a completely horrible job that they. You know, the, the school teacher cannot relocate to Omaha or something. Yes, the school teacher has to be in that, you know, or, or close to that. If this school teacher, with a regular salary of a completely honorable job, cannot afford uh, housing, you have to do something. So we, I, I agree, so we want public housing, okay. No, 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 why public housing? We want oh, housing. Oh, so then, 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 then they just decide after oh, with the experiment. Oh, okay. No, I'm just, I thought, no, because, well, no, they're building no. all these new apartments for 236 yeah. million dollars. Yeah, but you see, uh, raise if, if, we, if we have followed your argument, yeah. uh, in the 19th century, everything in Manhattan was panels, so there was nothing higher than that. So you should have said, you could have said. No, you had tenements too. You didn't well, tenements, yeah. And, and that's where but but they were no more than five stories. But you got high density. Good yeah, density. yeah, okay. yeah. The density was, by the way, the density in Manhattan uh, in 1910 was twice what it is now. That's uh, correct. Yeah, and twice and the population. Was so so that means that when you say, look, uh, we cannot build more because the streets, it's not no, true. No, no, I'm, 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 the, the issue, but I mean, I agree with you. You, 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 you made a, a straw man out of planners. Yes, yes, yes. I don't know okay. any of planners. Planners have all the things you were saying about gradients and, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, I think that's what, what, that's what we do. We, yes, we, yes. we work with yeah. the market. So yeah. the, 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 the issue becomes, when you take the New York City zoning, if you talk to the New York City planning department, they'll say, we promote what we call as a right zone. Yes. And then yes, what yes. happens? Yes. Yes. And then what happens is they, 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 you transfer development rights. Yes. You can use zoning lot merges. You have TDRs. Yes. Um, and and what? So, so they, you think they provide too much? What? No, I don't. I, the, as far as I'm concerned, what what it, it does it doesn't it doesn't get a real question. But what we now have is we have lawyers who just specialize in doing nothing but buying and selling air rights. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. And, and That's, I completely yeah. agree with you. So yeah. so I would rather have zoning. But you have something. But you have something. No, but I, I agree with you yeah. that uh, in a way I use planners as yeah. a proxy for a, okay. a much more complex system. But I could not every time say lawyers, lawyer, uh, you know, lawyers, uh, uh, you know, uh, councilmen, mayors, uh, uh, people who finance, uh, uh, you know, lobbyists and things like that. Yes, all these people. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What we, would, what we teach these students here is very much along the lines of to yeah. what, to how planners have to work with markets. And what yeah, right, like, yeah. And it's, but there's no easy answers. Uh, look, look at, uh, look at uh, the website of the, of the planning department of New York. They say, uh, and you know, I quote approximately, they say, we have been using zoning. Now we go beyond external. We, have, we are using zoning to shape the city. To shape the city. This, I think, is wrong. It's worse. It's worse than you're saying because yeah, yeah. what happens in New York, yeah. um, under New York law, uh, they define zoning as plan. In other words, as long as New York City zones consistent with a well considered plan, they can change zoning under New York law. Yeah. And what New York City says, if we think about a rezoning before we do it, we've well considered it. Yeah. So you're, you're stuck here. So I'm, uh, it, it's worse than you think. Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> I, think, I think so bad of it, it's difficult to be worse. But uh, uh, no, I think they, you know, they have completely dev they deviate from their own. Uh, and I agree on your first question who decides on the proper use of street space? They decide. They, I, I know that politically, if they were saying from now on, we are going to charge for parking in all the street of Manhattan, the, the mayor will not be elected. Yeah. As uh, there the was uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, the, the head of the uh, economic, uh, uh, you know, the European uh, um, Union, say, we know now in Europe what to do 
we don't know to get elected when we do the right thing. <laughs> and uh, that's, that, I, I would say it's a bit beyond my favor. The street space problem is um, people have <coughs> Fresh Direct, they have Amazon, they have UPS, they have Uber, they have Lyft, yeah. they have taxi cab, then we want bike lanes. Um, so the, yeah, the, yeah. the question is, how, how do we, um, and we only have the same amount of street space, Pricing. how do we put the buildings up higher? Pricing, get back to market. Okay, so uh, then what about the people who can't afford it? So you said saying, who has the most money can have the most access. No, because because uh, you did, you improve uh, public transport through this money. But, but, no. that, but that's got to be priced too, doesn't it? Yes, but... Yes, but that's, that's a, you know, if you price uh, uh, the, the street, you know, the use of the street, at least for vehicles, you know, uh, I, I cannot say it in my book, I mean, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the problem with individual cars is that, they, you know, if I drive at 20 miles an hour, which is the speed limit on Fifth Avenue, I am using 80 square meter of the most expensive land in the world, one of the most expensive land in the world, for free. This cannot work. This cannot work. I'd rather have a bus line. Yes, but even the bus line, you have to manage it so yes. that it's, it's used land very efficiently. And, and uh, it's not that easy. It's not so that so it's efficient and it's fast yes. so that people would want to use it. Yeah, right. Yeah. I'll, I'll stop. I, I no, no, I, 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 no, no, I, I like, I like uh, to be provoked a bit. Any more questions? Yes? How do you grapple with the fact that the decisions on small private parcels? Sorry? The, the decisions of people in the market on a small private parcel can be changed in one year. Yes. The infrastructure required to respond to the you know, all of those decisions added up might take 10 or 20 years. Yeah. To uh, so let, let us face it. Yeah, the infrastructure is an interesting issue. Don't forget that, uh, at least in Manhattan, uh, the infrastructure uh, of three years ago was sufficient for a double the population. So, uh, by the way, infrastructure has to be maintained also. <coughs> So, but that's where property tax comes in, and that's why, for instance, I think it's terrible to give a gift of property tax to Amazon. I, I went from Amazon, it's a wonderful idea to have Amazon coming to New York, but to attract them by giving away property tax is a terrible thing. You know, if it was by saying, well, we're going to improve the subway in order to attract you, I have no problem with that. Uh, but to give away property tax, and you know, many of the building here, you know, come out uh, as a as a property tax holiday because they uh, they allow the first effort to be commercial and accessible. So to use for politicians, to use property tax as a gift because it's very tempting for a politician. Doesn't that feel in the book? You know, what they were saying. We are giving that many years to, the, to this developer, people will see it. But for some reason, it doesn't appear in the book. It's just, it just the result is that you have less money to maintain the city, and therefore, the, also the tax base is going to shrink. It should be, it will be more and more the lowest income, and you know, will pay property tax, and the. The, the big office building and people will not pay for the tax because the developer thought it was a good idea to, to do it. So, yes, uh, infrastructure is not really an issue. If you have a, you know, many city have bonds and uh, which are based, you know, guaranteed by the property tax, and that's why they are not paid with the property tax. And those bonds are enough to finance the thing. Now, planners again should. Uh, uh, should be aware that uh, some part of the infrastructure in New York, for instance, are obsolete and should be renewed. And unfortunately, we see that also in Washington for the subway. They have not been maintaining it well, and this is a, this is a terrible mismanagement. You, know, you have to maintain your assets, if not. Uh, uh, and that's why uh, you know the resource for maintaining those assets. Imagine you you have a condominium, and uh, and the condominium. Uh, uh, Association wants to have, you know, they have some vacancy, and they say we will give away condo fee for the next 20 years. 
you know, the number within 20 years would be a ruin, you know, it would be ready to be demolished. And this is what the city is doing sometimes. So I, I think, you know, those questions are raising a question of, uh, uh, you know, what is the proper democratic uh, way of running a city? And I have absolutely no idea about that. It's a political solution, it's a political solution, you know. Why, for instance, uh, you know, one of the major problems we have here uh, in New York is, of course, the fragmentation of the responsibility you know, between the state of New York and the city, but also in New Jersey. In New Jersey, it's a, uh, it's a local municipality like Fort Lee, but also the state of New Jersey, the governor of New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, Long Island, and things like that. This is very, very, you know, we are creating there a we should have a, a city state which can go to the metropolitan area. But again, I'm not proposing that. It's not my job. I don't know anything about it. But uh, uh, I, you know, again, here, this is a big advantage of the Chinese cities that uh, the boundary of the creator has a revolution extremely wide. Uh, and uh, it's, it's easier to manage. Uh, now, in some cities, you know, for instance, Paris uh, is also fragmented. You know, the, municipality of Paris is only 2 million, but the conservation, you know, the, the economy base of Paris is 12 million. But uh, because of centralization, the tradition, you know, cultural centralization in, in France, uh, there is a technical body uh, which supervises the transport in the greater area, which would be a bit the equivalent of the, uh, the, the, the New Jersey for the point, you know, but which has a, an enormous prestige, which is uh, you know, run by engineers who are <coughs> And then they are able to overcome, let's say, the, uh, the reluctance of individual municipality who like to, to have the advantage of a train, but not for it as Sorry, it's a long sense. Yes. So I think, uh, Alain, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Um, I, I, I have a question, but uh, uh, just before that, a comment. I mean, I think. I mean, I have to say that I, you know, I, uh, when I first came across your work when you came to Tehran yes. in the early 2000s, um, I, I mean, I have to say that um, uh, for me, uh, you cannot underestimate, I, I think, the sort of the transformational paradigm that Alan is, 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 is offering here. Very different from how, how I was uh, uh, trained. And I think that, um, you know, it's the idea of regulation, and I think the misunderstanding maybe, Elliot, was that, is that the idea of regulation is that you can have regulations which are either market enabling or market depressing. And you need both kinds. No, you need... Yeah, sometimes more well, you need yeah. to uh, Well, the idea is... Well, okay, I, I, mean, I think the paradigm is that essentially that... I, okay, I'll tell you what was transformational for me, is when I saw that chart, um, and I think it's hard to overestimate, which is on 102 of your book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was astonished by that chart because I had been taught that neoclassical economics um, essentially is not very relevant because it's, it, it, it depends on a number of very, very unrealistic assumptions about perfect markets and so on and so forth. And here was empirical evidence showing that, in fact, the bit rent curves that we read actually work. That's the way cities actually function. Well, that, that, that's the population density you were showing. Here, uh, Alan also has data on land yeah, and, no, I understand. and land price. I understand. Like, all I'm trying to say is that if it was transformational for me. I'll, this is the reason. is because what I had thought was, what you taught was essentially a kind of theoretical exercise. Yeah. Turns out actually to describe quite well empirically many cities across the world. That's what you take enough courses for me. Well, that may be true. Uh, <laughs> that, that may be true. The question I have, uh, the question I have, Alan, is that you've said about urban planning um, uh, um, education. Yes, yes. That it has suffered from mission creep. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I wonder if you could expand a little bit what you mean by that. I mean, you talked about how you think urban planners have a basic task, which is yeah. separating private from public use, right, right, yeah. um, and then making sure that land is preparing land for right, yeah. the market, yes, right, for it to efficiently allocate uses. 
from what you understand about uh, urban planning education, where do you see the mission creep then coming? Is it beyond, beyond regulations? I mean, there's a whole area of issues of social justice and gender issues and yes, right. racial issues. Do you see that fitting in with urban planning education, or do you see that as a part of the mission creep and so forth? I, I think, you know, look, uh, you, when you develop a city, when a mayor become mayor, uh, he should put some priorities. Uh, you know, the city has evolved in a certain way, and it's possible that the mayor say, the first thing is environment. You know, for instance, if you are some Chinese city, the mayor will say the first thing is environment. You know, we, we have reached a point where uh, uh, another city, you know, if you are in Detroit, you say the first thing is to reestablish uh, employment in the city. So you see, the, 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 uh, as soon as you have defined this objective, and you know you don't have one objective; you have two or three uh, or four. Uh, then the planner should develop certain things which will achieve those objectives. Now, uh, mission creep will be if, uh, say, in Detroit, you say, well, the first thing is to reestablish, uh, you know, a, a labor market, and you say, well, why don't we zone all this uh, uh, area industrial? And uh, then the industry will come. That will not do anything, you know. Because again, my point is that even if you want to contradict market, the outcome of market, you have to understand how market work, and you know that uh, following a map do not attract industries. So you see that that's a that's a way. I, so you have mission creep as soon as you piggyback a lot of things that people like in a certain way, you know, uh, but uh, which are not. Uh, I see that. Uh, did I answer your question? Yes. I, there was just one thing about environmental sustainability. That you yeah. said you, is not a primary concern of urban planning. No. I, 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 it, it's a constraint on urban planning. It's a constraint. Yeah. What you mean by that? Well, you know, if you think the main objective, uh, for instance, of transport, if, is to reduce carbon emission, the objective, not the concern, then you should deplore. That's a Saudi allowing a woman to drive because uh, it was saving a lot of karma. So you see, uh, that's the difference between objective and constraint. Now, I agree that when you develop a transport system, uh, the, you know, the emission of GOG is very important. And so whatever transport system you do, you should try to decrease them. But if the main objective is not mobility, the main objective is decreasing, uh, then you, you, end up with, you end up with this plan where everybody bicycles to his work, you know? Or in a more, more, you know in, so there's another question here that ladies asked. I have a question, I just want to go back to something that uh, Kiana's raising. Sorry. The um, decreasing population density curves that you Yes, yes. Um, which raises a question for me about uh, the metric that you're calling for. Yes. Um, because it seems to me your point that those uh, that that's sort of the um, confirmation that this kind of new classical economic model of the city um, you know exists um, um, seems valid in the way that you presented those yeah. specific charts, and you laid out very helpfully and clearly for us that those were based on yeah. measures of population density that were consistent across all of the cities based on this kind of concentric zone model yeah. that is moving out from the central district of the city. Um, I have a question about whether that is in fact an appropriate way to measure the change of population density over area in all of those different contexts, given the history of the development of those specific cities. And so thinking through the precise methodology behind each of those metrics are themselves um, incredibly valuable and don't necessarily, in my mind, protect us against the kind of propaganda um, of non-metric informed um, planning methods that you were talking about at the beginning. So you know, I started measuring that not to confirm the theory, but just I was curious about that. Uh, the, what, what intrigued me uh, very much, uh, you know, in a way, this theory is based on the non-centric model. And suddenly, you see in cities like Atlanta and Los Angeles, which are not from the Oh, you know, uh, the, the, the center of uh, Los Angeles, if you consider the CBD, contain, I think, less than six or seven percent of jobs. So it's 
And why, why did this apply to cities which completely contradict the model? Uh, don't forget that you, you, could, you could decide that a city has no CBD, you know, uh, the CBD of, of Los Angeles is so small, or Atlanta is so uninteresting, that you consider it. You, a city still has a shape, and the shape has a centroid. So we place a CBD by the centroid, and you will find that, in fact, people by themselves and job, you know, and price uh, follow this curve. So in, uh, in my book, I put an hypothesis. Uh, why is it so? Why it, it contradict the model, but the outcome is conformed to the model, which is bizarre. So again, you know, I'm not. Uh, I came to economics on the side, and I'm not trying to confirm something that I read in the paper. You know, I'm observing things, and then somebody tell me, you know, you observe that, but we have been working on it for 50 years, and this is what you get. So I'm, I, you know, again, uh, I'm complete. I have no ideology. I'm completely. I'm ready to shift. Uh, I don't know if you have an alternative way of measuring density. I mean, you could measure density differently. But uh, uh, my guess is that you will find, you know, the way people, you have seen the, on the cover of my book, this is non ideological. This is the way people locate themselves in the city. Uh, it's just densities, you know. It's, uh, uh, so it, you, you have to explain what you know. If you don't want to explain it, you have to take it into account. Uh, you know, you may not want to explain it. But did I answer the question? Or, yeah. uh, so, uh, if you find an alternative, you know, I'm completely ready. You know, when I work in Russia or, or China, you know, Russia at, at the time, you know, before the reform, or China before the reform, uh, I had a completely open mind. You know, I realized also that. Uh, uh, you know, the subway in Moscow, of course, is fantastic. You know, better than, uh, so I have no problem with that. Uh, you know, I could change ideology from any day, uh, you know, but you consider ideology if I could see that something worked. But when I see things that are not working, uh, I, I, you know, I cannot advocate it. But I don't forget, uh, on the ideology, uh, I understand that many people could disagree with me on the value of the outcome of some markets. Uh, by the way, some markets are distorted, and we know they are distorted. Uh, uh, if you, well, for instance, uh, transport, if you don't pay for all uh, the, the markets, you know, the land markets are distorted. So, but if you want to correct it, you have to go to the distortion. You don't have to have a proxy for the distortion. You see, if not, you will, you will not succeed. For instance, say, if you are in a country where uh, the government expropriate farmers in the periphery without paying the market price for land, just expropriate it, this happened in the other countries, uh, the city probably will expand too much. Uh, so, the, 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 you know, the city collects that. It's not to put a wall around the city, so the city should not expand. To correct that, you have to say, we have to pay the market price. You know, the farmers should not be expropriated. You should pay for their land only when they are willing to, to sell it. You know, so that's, that's the way I would like to pay. But I agree that markets are distorted. But again, if you, if you understand market, you deal with the distortion first. Yes. Back to my one. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, so I think the title itself, Cities with, Without Orders, is. Um, I don't know. It's not Cities Without Orders. Cities. It's, 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 uh, order it's Order Without Design. Order Without Design. Order without order design. design. <laughs> and, and, how to, and actually, the first memory of being urban planner students is actually we were given design of cities. This is how cities should look like. Right, Those it. are. Yes. Those are my first, first memories of being a urban planner student. And given, given, uh, given the idea of order without design, uh, and how you explain in China and Jakarta, how, and uh, the notion of giving 
we have, uh, as an urban planner, we have to be, uh, design uh, and set up such networks in order for a market to thrive. Yes. And what what I observe in developing countries such as uh, Jakarta, where I yeah. live, it's ah. so, it's so much depressing because um, the 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 cities were designed like a hundred years ago, and they designed uh, the network as. Uh, not enough for the market to thrive. Th yes. Therefore, urban planners and all the planning regulations is always one step behind the market. Yes. And so the urban planners, in, in my sense, urban pla uh, the urban planners in uh, Jakarta is not, is not uh, doesn't have enough political power as, uh, as of the real estate developers who are much, much sm smarter, smarter and ha know how to make the urban planners make such regulations in order to search yeah. for them. But how, how uh, what do you observe from your experience from the World Bank and working in like different uh, countries? Well, let's countries? just stick to Jakarta. Okay, uh, Jakarta, uh, yes. You know, uh, Jakarta, uh, when I started working in Jakarta, the, the CBD was just a little uh, north of the, uh, south of the port, you know. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, next to the monument, you know, the, the Volvo Hotel. That was a CBD at the time. Well, I'm an old guy. It is still. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then he kept moving, you know, to the Golden Triangle, to a little north of that. And now there is a new CBD. If you look at it, you see that the, the latest big towers, uh, by, you know, by developers, you know, very well say they were powerful developers, are in fact centering the city toward the, the center of gravity of the population. That has not been done by planners. You know, the planners, let's say, agreed horribly, as you say, under the pressure of the developers, I suppose mm -hmm. you think that. Uh, it was not all negative. What is negative is that, of course, uh, there was not enough investment in transport. There was also, on the part of planners, I remember the time where there were planners who were saying, well, uh, just uh, around, even within the municipality of Jakarta, but in the Jabotarek area, uh, the density should not be more than 40 people per hectare. Now, already, if you looked at the time, at the price of land in this area, most of the people could not afford a, a 20 square meter plot at, you know, uh, if, uh, uh, you know, which will have, uh, so, this density was completely unrealistic given the price of land and the income of the population. The planners, instead of saying, realizing that and saying, yes, we are going to have much higher densities, you know, in the corridor between, say, Bekasi and Jakarta or, or Tangerang and Jakarta, if we need uh, uh, higher, you know, we need to plan for higher densities, they, they assume that the density will be low. Because, uh, you know, they, they say, well, uh, if we have a low density, we can use oxidation ponds, we don't need to develop a sewer system, so it's safe on, uh, on sewer. And uh, that was a mistake, because again, they didn't understand markets. Mm -hmm. So you see, I'm not saying that they, will sh they should follow what the developers, or represent also market, are saying. They should anticipate, you know, if you put together the income of the population and the price of land, that's the good density. You know, that's the density you, you would expect. And uh, uh, so that's a way, rather than decide, uh, you know, we are going to keep the density at 20 or 50 people per hectare because we, we find it convenient. Did I answer your question? Yeah, it's always, it's always because it's convenient, not because it's... Uh, right. It's because well it's researched. likely to happen. It's yeah, you see. The, the income of people and land prices and rents are something you should monitor all the time as a planner. The planner don't do it. They always think that they can allocate land, just, you know, we are going to design a city for the poor, and they design something, and if you, you use the price of land and the rate of interest, you know, in Jakarta also, they, the, the planners used to say, uh, we will use a reasonable rate of interest. There is no such thing as a reasonable rate of interest. There is a, a rate of interest, period. <laughs> you know, so uh, when they say reasonable rate of interest, it, they mean it's tropical and affordable without enormous subsidy that the government doesn't have. 
So you see, that's what I mean by planners have to understand markets. You know, they, and both engineers and architects have a tendency, sorry, actually, <laughs> to uh, not to take seriously the price of land and not to take uh, interest rates seriously. Because they are used to, you know, a ton of cement, this is the price of a ton of cement. This is serious stuff. This is the price of a ton of steel, and those are commodities, so you could compare it you know, to international CO or whatever. And, uh, but rate of interest and, and land price are constantly varying from place to place uh, this time. So they think that this is arbitrary. Somebody is deciding about the, the rate of the price of land, and those are bad people who put the high price of land. It, you know, it is true that sometimes the price of land is much higher than it should be, but it's only because of constraints which are put. For instance, again, getting back to Jakarta, uh, I don't know if the, the way building permit is distributed is still the same, but in the time I was working there, uh, the government would give a, a monopoly to developer for a large area where they could you know, they could acquire land, but they were not in competition with other developers. Uh, I don't know if it's still like that. It's it's the government basically gives the periphery of land and then for the developers. Yeah, right, yeah. Like and they, they, didn't, they didn't have to buy all of it, but they had the monopoly mm -hmm. on an area of, say, one developer on five or six kilometers, square kilometers. And then they could pick up there, but they were not in competition with other. So here you could say, well, uh, the price of land is too high because of this practice. And Again, it's an understanding of market. If you give a monopoly to somebody, you're pretty sure the price will be high. So you see, understanding market allow you to do something what I think is very social. But if you ignore it, if you just design... Uh, I'm sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, okay. uh, I was kind of curious how this can also sort of apply to Tokyo, because Tokyo uh, itself is an outlier because it has yes. a robust transportation system yes. that's both public and private. Yeah. Because the free yes, system is developed. Uh, Japanese planner, I think, did exactly. They concentrated on the transport system, on the main roads. They do not allow, by the way, uh, on all parking, uh, most of the street, all the parking is off street. So they had, they did, I, I asked a, a Japanese colleague why it was so, why it's so different from uh, you know the zoning of other. And they told me uh, that uh, at, you know, after the war, uh, the cities were completely destroyed. And so the, the planners tried to do a plan, traditional plan, or to rebuild, you know, it was a big occasion to build Tokyo or Yokohama in a, in a very modern way. And then they realized that because the city were destroyed, there were a lot of people who had nowhere to go. Business could not start again because you had this uncertainty of, uh, you know, where, where to build it. So they decided that uh, it was better to let the people build whatever they wanted and that they concentrated only on the things which were important, the main arterial road and public transport. So that's why you have this fantastic network, of, uh, you know, which goes very far away, actually, the, of public transport. And, uh, and they let, uh, within this, uh, let's say, it was not quite a grid, but they went grid of probably more than a kilometer or two kilometers where you have this arterial road. They say basically, we don't give a damn what's happening there. Uh, we will just provide the, you know, and they provided the infrastructure and uh, connected <coughs> them to the infrastructure. So, so in a way, it was a bit by accident, by this, but pragmatism. You know, I will compare that to uh, Christchurch, New Zealand, you know, they had an earthquake some of uh, 10 years ago, no, six, six years ago. And uh, the planners there, say, and the, the, the earthquake destroyed mostly the central the part of uh, Christchurch. Uh, the planners say, this is a fantastic opportunity. Uh, let us build a, a model city, a wonderful city where, you know, uh, livable and... Uh... But in a democratic country, to do a wonderful city, it takes a lot of time. After five years, they have not settled on the plan. They have to many hearings and uh, you know things like that. The city, the city didn't stop. You know, business cannot stop, uh, even if the center of the city is destroyed. 
So all the business have moved to the suburbs. And by the time they had the plan, which was ready, the city has completely restructured uh, in a different way, and there were no takers for the center, which has lost its value. Because you cannot stop a city during time. You know, if it's a few blocks, yes, but not an entire city center. You block it. And by the way, in this city center, they were still building, which were intact, could have been. But because they wanted to take the opportunity to have a, a, a wonderful plan, they cordoned it off, and they could not operate their business there. Uh, because there was this uncertainty that the building would be demolished. So you see, this is an example of uh, uh, pragmatism being more uh, useful than, you know, again, the, the perfect plan. You know, a city is not like a telephone or a bridge or, 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 a, uh, or a clock. You know, it is not a manufactured product. It is a living thing. You know, you cannot, you cannot stop a city from living. And, uh, and it's evolved because of the people are doing things. You cannot prevent people from doing things, saying, wait here, you know, uh, before you, I finish my plan, you should stop living. No. You cannot do that. Did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Because I think also, um, Japan has a tradition of having brand ownership of department stores who own the land and build real most of the customers to yes. department stores. And, all the systems are integrated. Right, yeah. 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 Like but really that's, that's, by the way, also the way the, the railways uh, across the continent were built in the US. You know, it was also a real estate operation. 